Today, I wanna to teach you my six tricks on how to make an amazing traditional mead. Let's get started. You might be asking, what is a traditional mead? If you've never made mead before, it is just honey and water and yeast. No fruit, no spices, no alternative flavors. So it is literally just taking whatever honey you got, whether it be as simple as clover, wildflower, all the way to the extremes of radish, avocado, whatever you have, and converting it into this beautiful beverage called mead. I have two traditional meads in front of me, and I love to do this because it's fun to see what flavors honey provides. Every honey is different, every wildflower honey is different, so you can always have some fun test tasting and testing different honeys around you. So let's go ahead and talk about how to make that great traditional mead. Whatever honey you have, step one to make a great traditional mead is to have high quality honey. There is a lot of honey out there that is not true honey. It might be, um, I almost said the word laced. It might have sugars that aren't honey based in there. It might not be from the bees. It's really important that you do some research to find out if that honey is true. More than likely, if you got the honey for really, really, really cheap, probably not real honey. Why does this matter? You can taste a huge difference when you buy, let's say something that does have corn syrup or any of these alternative sugars in it, when you stack it up against a mead that's featuring true honey that has not been messed with. Now I say not been messed with, in that you wanna also find honey that is unpasteurized if possible, which is the process where they heat it up a bunch, and unfiltered. Sometimes honey providers will heat up the honey to help get it into the vessel container. And it's if you stay below a certain temperature range that it stays unpasteurized. One quick identifier of good quality honey is if it is crystallized, it is probably good quality and that's just because of how that process works when you start to filter honey or you don't have true honey in there and it's never crystallizing something's wrong so crystallized honey is actually a good thing you just warm it up slightly and you can use it start with good honey first step buy nice honey tip number two is to check your water now i know that seems simple but with as simple as a traditional mead is as simple as it is i should say the honey, water, yeast, you only have three ingredients you're really hiding behind, or you can hide behind, and that's not a lot of coverage. Your water is one of the biggest parts of that. Of course the honey is, like we just talked about, but the water profile is important. If you're sketched out by your water, you, like you won't drink a glass of tap water at your own house, I probably would not use your tap water to brew with. I'd just go ahead and go to the store, buy yourself a gallon of water, it's pretty cheap, normally about a dollar, and use that as your base. All water around is different. Your water might be awesome, and that's great, but just make sure your water doesn't have any hard chemicals in it, or it doesn't have things that are going to mess with the fermentation, stuff like the pH balance of it. Sometimes they put different uh, chlorides and stuff like that in tap water to help make them sanitary and all those things, so those can play with the water. You do not want to use distilled water. That's important here. Distilled water has no little minerals or anything in there to add anything to the brew. So that's gonna automatically make it feel very flabby and not great. So don't use distilled water, but find or use nice water. Tip number three, you need to pick a yeast that is going to be complementary to whatever flavor you're going for. Let's say you're using orange blossom honey, which has a tropical note to it, obviously. If you pick a yeast that enhances tropical flavors, something like the Lauvin QA23, you might find that that will bring out more of that nice note from the honey that you like into the brew. So when you pick a yeast and you're looking for whatever profile, it's easy to taste your honey and go, ooh, I get notes of this and I get notes of this or whatever you're doing there. Google it and say, what, what kind of yeast would get me a, uh, is good for berry profiles? I'm using a, a blueberry honey and I wanna use a yeast that will really help with that. Well, you can Google it and normally find some answers online that will help you sort that out. Some yeasts that aren't great to use, stuff like champagne yeast. The Lauvin EC1118 is a notable yeast in the brewing world, in the mead world, and I've used it many times 
it does not do great with traditional meads. And this is because it's intended for high alcohol production and quick production. Most of the flavor profile, I should say a lot of the flavor profile, comes from the sensory, the smelling, and all those things as you taste. When you blow off the aromatics because of a vigorous fermentation, when you're fermenting, you are losing part of those nice honey characters. So you want to use a yeast, not necessarily that's slow or anything like that, but you want to use something that is going to be not extremely fast in its fermentation because you'll lose some nice aromatic characters from the honey, therefore losing a lot of the flavor profile that you might want. I've been talking a lot and I need a drink. So this is a macadamia nut traditional mead and it is carbonated. Now you might ask yourself, based off of my note three, how would I pick a yeast that is going to be highlighting nutty profile? Personally, I haven't found many that do that. So I just went with something that was more straight, um, a clean fermenter, which is very important. You want something that's gonna cleanly ferment and it's not going to, uh, again, vigorously ferment. I did not use like a bread yeast in this and I know that some people watching this are gonna say, well, I use bread yeast all the time. The problem with bread yeast is that it is not really brewer's grade specific and so it doesn't have great stats. It doesn't really contribute anything to the profile in good ways in my opinion. So I would stay away from it, maybe for your first brew, but a good little graduation step into more fermentation is to go ahead and invest in some wine yeast. You already spent like 20 bucks on honey, why not spend two bucks on yeast? Oh, that's fantastic. Whew, liquid honey and alcohol. So let's move on to number four. This is a great example of what I'm talking about here. This is that macadamia, traditional mead, carbonated, and I'll talk about carbonation and those things in a second, how they help. With this specific brew, I fermented on the macadamia blossom honey and got that nice profile. And then I came back and I back sweetened this brew with the same honey. So you might consider keeping some of your honey that you used in the beginning to add later on. And this will help bolster up that flavor of the honey again. Also add some sweetness, which is nice, but it really adds the flavor of that honey back to it. You can use a different kind of honey if you wanna go and get different profiles, but if you were really wanting to highlight that specific wildflower that you love, use that wildflower honey again. This is really only useful if you're gonna be back sweetening a mead though. If you don't plan on back sweetening and you just wanna keep your mead dry or you don't need to back sweeten for whatever reason, um, that's fine. But this keeping the original honey really helps to highlight the traditional mead character that you want. I'm gonna use this one for example again. So we're making our traditional mead. I made this macadamia, nut, blossom, traditional mead. I, my little step five or tip five is to uh, learn how to balance the mead. There is this little, well, my, my buddy doing the most designed it. And so I'm gonna kind of steal from it and also shout him out here. But the Triforce of Balance is a video that he has made and it talks about balancing a brew. What he is talking about and what I'm gonna tell you about here is the trifecta, the little pyramid that is sweetness and tannin and acidity. There's this little balancing pyramid that will help your brew taste better and have a better um, long lasting taste, finish, all of those things. If you have the sweetness there generally to support the brew. Now, if you don't want a sweet brew, obviously you're gonna, that's a different, that little side might not be there. You have sweetness, you have the tannin, which is the um, feeling in your mouth. Think about maybe a red wine, if you've ever had that before. They are high in tannins. So they normally will pull that moisture out of your mouth. You'll feel like maybe a bigger body from it, generally speaking, when you have a lot of tannin. And then the last one is acidity. And that is like lemon juice, lime juice, stuff that you've had before that's acidic. When you perfectly balance your brew with honey and some tannin, whether that tannin source is something like maybe you oaked the brew with oak chips or cubes, or you added some powdered wine tannin, which generally comes from like different kind of chestnuts and trees and all this stuff like this as a whole list. Or you, um, you added something like carbonation, which we're gonna talk about in a moment. If you balance those two, you're gonna get a good thing, sweetness and, and tannin. And then your acidity, if you notice the brew is not, doesn't have any bite, and you don't want bite as in like lemon juice, like 
If this thing tasted like lemon juice, it would not be as good. It has a lot of warm, rich honey character with a smidge bite or um, uh, brightness that comes from acidity. You can balance with things like specific brewing acids, citric acid, malic acid, a tartaric acid. You can use lemon juice, which is citric acid, lime juice. Things like that are gonna, uh, are gonna balance that sweetness with the tannin, with the acidity. This thing, in my opinion, I know you, you're watching this going, he's just saying this. I've, <laughs> I've given this to people before and they really liked it. Um, this thing is balanced really well. You got a nice sweetness, you got some tan in there, and then we have that acidity, good old package happening right here. The most important part of this traditional mead is the honey. If you aren't tasting the honey that you used, something's up. You want to have that honey character be there. Taking you back to point number one, high quality honey will win the day. Point number six, you got to consider your alcohol content. How much alcohol is going to be in this brew? It kind of takes us a little bit into point number five. The lower alcohol content your brew is, the more likely that you are going to have a watery uh, tasting brew because there is not a lot of uh, body built up. For example, this is a 7% mead. I chose to carbonate this mead because I knew, especially after tasting it, pro or after it finished fermenting, I was like, this is not very full bodied. It's kind of just watery, it washes down. Um, you taste like the honey and all this, and that's great, but like I want this to have some long lasting appeal. So the lower alcohol content, I'm gonna go ahead and say like 10% and oh, I'll say 8% and below. You're gonna wanna do something to bolster body to help that ABV. We're not changing the ABV by any means, but you are supporting it with carbonation or more tannin or something like that. I love carbonating low alcohol content meads because it just works well. I have tried to um, use a lot of powdered wine tannin or oak or stuff for like a 7% mead and I'm not always super pleased with it to be honest with you. It just doesn't seem like it's, it's still got a watery element, like you're trying really hard to just fix it. But the carbonation, that's where it's at. I have a whole video on how to carbonate a brew in multiple ways. So if you wanna go find those, I'll put them both around as well. So lower alcohol content brews, you're gonna probably need to support it. And this, this is like an overall overarching thing, but very special to traditional meads. When you have things like fruit, spices, sometimes you're building out body because of fruit skins, because of fruit juice, because of the spices, those elements, stuff like that, that might help you fill out the body at a lower ABV. You might not have to actually add any carbonation, but honey water yeast, there's not much there to give you big body. So lower ABV, consider maybe carbonating a traditional mead. Flipping the other side, I'm gonna open up my other bottle here. This is a radish honey mead. This is a 10% mead. Now, this is higher alcohol, which means that I'm going to have less problems building out this body, but I'm still gonna try and, and uh, again, go back to my little balancing triangle. I need to fill out the body here. And so with this one, this is radish blossom honey. I added lots of oak and some, uh, I believe it was like citric or, or malic acid in this specific circumstance. Yeah, so this is like this being carbonated has a lot of cling. This has a cling in a different manner. You get that honey, the richness, the sweetness from the honey, because I did back sweeten it. There's some oak in there that really helps to add some tannin. So you add, have some activity <laughs> happen here. And overall, it's just a nice, pleasant thing. Whatever ABV you're at, you're gonna need to do some adjusting of sorts. There are very, very few meads that I've ever had come out of a fermentation, stuck in a bottle and said, that's it, I didn't have to do anything. Traditional meads are hard and they're especially hard for that circumstance. One little fun thing is if you add honey to your brew, you are gonna add um, a little bit more sugary content, obviously, but that comes with some bigger body as well. So if you super back sweeten a mead, you're gonna have something that's a little more, um, maybe a little more chunky. I don't know for a better term than that. I've got a little, some bonus things here. With every mead, you need to provide the proper amount of yeast nutrient to your brew, especially when it comes to traditional meads because 
any fermentation faults have nothing to hide behind. You're uh, hoping that the honey profile stays there after fermentation. Whatever nice water you have has worked well and the yeast you've chose all collaborate to be this beautiful product. But there's not a lot of uh, room for you to hide behind a funky fermentation, maybe one that got too hot or the yeast stressed and so they put off off flavor. When you have other flavors, let's say you use fruit, you might be able to hide behind some of those things a little more. Not so much with a traditional mead. So using honey, water, and yeast, it's pretty tough. There's a category called a show mead. A show mead is honey, water, yeast, and no adjuncts. It's literally just, it's like one of the hardest profiles to make because you're not adding any oak, you're not adding anything to adjust it. You are just relying solely on the honey and nice water profile and good yeast. You can't add anything else. It's kind of tough to do. When I first started, everyone told me to get good at making traditional meads. And I stand here today not saying that I am the best by any means, but I have spent a lot of time making them. And I think I've improved my skills by taking those six main tips and applying them. And I hope that you will do that too. I still have a lot to learn. And maybe there's a tip seven, tip eight down the road. However, I think these six are a great place to start. I'd love to know what you think down below. Have you experienced some of these things? What are some tips that you might give us? We all need to learn together, including myself, and I love getting to uh, share my knowledge that I have with you. So thank you for watching. Go make a traditional mead. It's so fun, and the honeys you can get in the world are great. Of course, support your local apiaries, the people who are uh, making honey around you, collecting honey. If you want to get a little more adventurous and try some fun different kinds of honeys, like radish honey, macadamia blossom, you can go out on the internet and find some things and buy some uh, interesting things as well. Get good experience with different kinds of honeys, and I hope to see some great traditional meads in your future. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe if you enjoyed this, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.